I want to read a scripture. We're going to pray together. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8 says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you not, do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. An inexpressible and glorious and unspeakable joy. We've been talking about joy. I feel like it's fitting to talk about joy today given what we've just witnessed which, if you didn't smile, laugh, or tear up, you're probably dead. Because <laughs> it's just one of the cutest moments of the entire year to be able to kind of watch all the kids come together and do their thing. And they, they did an amazing job. Um, we, we've been on this journey, though, of, of uncovering, discovering, realizing that joy has very little to do with what our circumstances look like and have everything to do with the condition of our heart and most importantly, who resides there. If you have Jesus in your heart, then you will have joy. Joy and the desire for joy is a supernatural desire that can only be met with a supernatural source. Supernatural source. I'm so thankful for the joy that God brings us today. Can we pray together? Come on. Jesus, we thank you so much uh, for your presence here. God, we thank you that no children were harmed in the presentation of that Christmas story, at least that we know of, God. We just ask that, um, Lord, the message that they so aptly communicated to us would be one that would take root in our hearts, not just in this season, but all year round. God, and would make a difference in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, can I read again? Is that okay? Okay. You don't really have a choice. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. It uh, says, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius, who's, whose mom names their kid Quirinius? His mom, apparently. It's, a, it's an easy question, but you still got to wonder. Well, he was governor of Syria. And everyone, I'm, you know, it's kind of quiet there. I'm just, if, you're, if you know a Quirinius, don't take it personally. I'm sorry. <laughs> just sucks to be you. Um, Everyone, who, everyone went to their town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave, born, uh, she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Um, set the stage very quickly. You've got Mary, a young girl, probably in the area of 13, 14 years old. She's pregnant. She has been reading all of the mommy blogs. She's been reading like what to expect when you're expecting. She's probably got her birth plan in order so she knows the essential oils that she needs rubbed and she knows where and when. Um, as she's going through labor, she's got her flip-flops with her. She's got um, her antiperspirant. She's got a little bit of makeup for that post-birth picture. Um, she probably has her playlist all set. She's got some Bonnie Vare and some nature music for like the early stages of labor and ACDC for when things get real. Like she's prepped and she's re highway to hell. Come on. She's prepped and she's ready to go. She's got her plan together, and then Joseph says, Mary, there's a census. we got to go to Bethlehem. I mean, she no doubt was not planning on a road trip. You're not supposed to fly in the, the, the final weeks of pregnancy, but here she is nearly full term, and Joseph says, we've, we've got to go. And so they head out from Nazareth, where they are, um, 150 kilometers to Bethlehem, a journey that by foot um, would take the average person about 33 hours, a pregnant woman with all of the bathroom stops and, and foot rubs. You're talking 33, 40, who knows how many hours it took them to travel this particular journey. I'd imagine as they're nearing Bethlehem, Mary, um, you know, with full faith in her husband, uh, leans over. She's on the donkey. He's walking beside and says, Joe, do you have the reservation code for the hotel? Joseph, like any good man, knows he doesn't because we didn't think ahead. And we just think we'll get a place when we get there. It'll take care of itself. And he says, oh, uh, Mary, yeah, actually, it's um, about that. It's just a different setup. You know, they didn't, they didn't need to give me a code. But it's five-star rustic kind of a theme room you know like he's got nothing 
And they get there. There's no place for them. There's no room for them. The hotel is full. Joseph didn't make a reservation, which is not going to help him in the next, you know, the next few hours as she heads into birth. And, and they finally get settled up in a stable. The pregnancy is not going as planned. The process, no doubt, is not as advertised. It certainly isn't what Mary talked about when she was having coffee with all of her pregnant mommy friends. This is not what the plan was. And to the world at this time, the arrival of Jesus, like he did not show up as advertised. To any Jewish person um, who would have, and, and most Jewish people at this point would have been familiar with the Torah, um, the ancient writings, early scripture. They would have known that there was a Messiah coming. They would have known about that promise and they would have envisioned a rescuer and a hero. Someone like King David or, or maybe, um, maybe Moses who led his people out of captivity. Uh, people would have imagined a scene that looked a lot more like Braveheart and a lot less like this is us. <laughs> but... But here we are. Jesus, the plan was that he was going to come, overturn evil, cut taxes, take a tangible physical throne, conquer the enemy, and establish Israel as a power once and for all. Nowhere in the Jewish mindset, nowhere in the Jewish expectation, nowhere in the advertisements of the coming Messiah was there room for a young carpenter, was there room for a blue-collar dad, a pregnant unwed teenager in a barnyard. But the arrival of Christ onto the scene, like Jesus jumping into humanity, really serves as like a crescendo in the song of Scripture, demonstrating with certainty that, that God will do miraculous things to really unspectacular people in unspectacular situations. Takes the most average the most normal, the most unassuming and unexpected, and God shows up and decides to save humanity through them. This is a theme that runs constant throughout the entire Bible. And, and, and 2,000 years ago, he sends hope to the world through a couple of scared, frightened, likely teenagers. What? I mean, that's just got, you got to just wonder. If he can do that with them, what's, what could he do with a room like this? What's the potential in a room like this if God can totally turn the world on its head through a blue-collar Joe and an unwed, pregnant teenage mom? I mean, the possibilities are endless. If anyone could have put together a list of excuses to live an ordinary life, to live a natural life, to live um, an insignificant life and do nothing for God, it would have been Mary and Joseph. But God constantly overrides circumstance with calling. And so for them, um, they could have used their external circumstances as an excuse, but just know this this morning, that your external circumstance is not an obstacle for what God wants to do, and it cannot be an excuse for what he's asked you to do. It's neither. Verse 8 of our story, the narrative says there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were freaked out. I love the, the shepherds. You know, we, we kept true to Christmas pageantry form today. We had three little shepherds out here. And I think when we get to heaven at some point, um, you track down the shepherds, like we don't know their names. It could be like, hey, I'm Jonathan. You're one of the shepherds. Like, I think they're going to introduce themselves like, hey, yeah, I'm shepherd number one, shepherd number two, <laughs> shepherd number three. Really nice to meet you. You know, they just, like, who are these guys? Jesus' PR team needs, to, needs a heavy overhaul. Because if, if, if you were going to come and save humanity, you would have done the announcement, all, probably everyone in this room, we would have done it a different way in a different place. He could have come anywhere. Like he could have rolled up into Caesar Augustus' palace. He could have come with legions of angels and horses. He could have just like, like just floated into the throne room of the Caesar with some semi-automatics and taking care of business like right there. What's up? I'm here. Done. He's taken over. Could have like blasted them with lightning. Like Jesus could have done whatever he wanted to do. He, 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 had, he was God. He could have done anything. We would have done it differently. Instead, he chose Bethlehem, which was a little insignificant town about 10 kilometers outside of a city. I mean, think about, it'd be like Balzac in the north, you know? She's kind of... You're driving to cross iron mills, 
and you're not even really sure where Balzac is, but we all see the sign and we giggle a little bit, and then we get to, then we get to the mall, you know. <laughs> like that's, that's about as significant as Bethlehem was. But in all of that, God had a plan. Because see, something very important was going to happen in the conversation between the angel and the shepherds. God was going to communicate a truth that if we're really going to understand Jesus, we need to understand this. The angel said to them, do not be afraid. I, will, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Good news of great joy for all people. Now, the angel comes. I mean, it's pretty, it's, I mean, we kind of get what he's saying. Guys, I got some great news. This is awesome. Now, to us, it sounds very exciting. But you got to understand, to the shepherds, this was language that was very common. To say something was great news, uh, all, of, all of the people, the announcers that would communicate on behalf of Caesar Augustus, always used the term great news before they talked about something Caesar was doing. So, so to the shepherds, great news wasn't really great news. It was more like fake news. It was false advertising. Because every time they heard great news, it didn't really mean anything great. It was like, great news, we're going to up the taxes. Great news, we've called the census. Great news, there's new laws for you to obey. See, great news was, was really just part of political propaganda. Great news and what followed it generally meant like more struggle, more oppression. It was simply a reminder to the Jewish people that they weren't sovereign. They were controlled by another power. So that was what followed great news. But this was different because it said, hey, I bring you great news or good news of, of great joy. Now, see, that's different because it's good news, but it promises great joy. In fact, it says the good news will cause great joy. Like if you can wrap your head around the good news, then joy is a byproduct. You don't even have a choice. Joy just happens. Causes great joy. For everybody. I mean, this is different. So I believe the shepherds kind of leaned in a little bit. So you're telling us there's good news, but it's going to produce great joy. Now, that's not news we've heard before. Tell us more. They say, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. I love that it's born to you. God is a personal God. He's born to you. You might only be here to watch a kid this morning, but you need to know that a couple thousand years ago, a Savior was born, not just for the world, not just for me, not just for my family, not just for people who go to church every Sunday, was born to you. It's, he's your God. He's your Savior. It's your personal hookup. He's born to you. So that he is the Messiah, the Lord, and this will be a sign to you. Find the baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a major. They lean in. Okay, so what is this good news that brings great joy? Tell me more. He says, well, there's a Savior. He's born to you. He's the Messiah, and he's the Lord. The Savior, the Messiah, and the Lord. Again, to really understand the weight of this, you need to know that that was common cultural language. In fact, uh, Caesar Augustus required people to talk about him using those terms. He, he considered himself the Lord of the region. He was the savior of the people. He was the king of kingdoms. In fact, it was Caesar Augustus who instituted Pax Romana, which was peace in Rome, which would last for a couple of hundred years. He was, to everybody's natural mind and understanding, the emperor of peace. And so, so he was the savior of the people, but he taxed them. It came at a cost to the people. He had anointed himself king, and he was lord over the people, but his rule looked a lot more like a, an oppressive dominion. Luke, the author of Scripture, so smart and, and, and very um, intentionally, uses the same language not to describe Caesar Augustus, but to describe Jesus, almost contrasting the two. So it's familiar language, but Jesus in this moment is actually redefining what good news really is. He's saying, listen, there's a new Savior, and he saves with no strings attached. Come on, there's a Messiah, but no person anointed him, and he didn't anoint himself, but the God of the universe has anointed him to be the chosen one. He's Lord. And so where Augustus oppressed people to become Lord, Jesus offers himself as their Lord. 
where Augustus is 1,500 miles away calling for a census, forcing people to come to reinforce his value. Jesus comes to us to reinforce ours. And this is where the story gets interesting because the, the angels announce say, if you want the good news to cause you great joy, you've got to understand Jesus as both Savior and Lord. And they're different. See, they're different, but they cannot be separated. See, at Christmas time, it's not just the birth of our Savior, it's the birth of our Lord. You cannot have one without the other, but so often we try to do just that. I love Savior. Like, Savior's good. Save to rescue. You know, notice, like, people who need rescuing aren't too picky about who rescues them. Like, you got somebody drowning, and they're flailing, help! Help! Somebody swims out, it's like, go back, I thought you'd be taller. Like, it's just, that's not the way it works. I mean, that, that's why we can receive Jesus as Savior. Sure, it's not the package. Sure, if we were going to write the script, we'd do it a little bit differently. But hey, if you're going to save me, I'll take saving. It's fine. I'll take rescue from just about anyone. But Lord, that's harder. See, Lord is an issue for a lot of people. I'll be honest with you. Lord, almost every day is an issue to me. Because Lord means master, owner, supreme authority. Lord sounds intense. But if you look in the Bible, the word Savior is mentioned 36 times. Lord, 7,800. Where do you think God puts his priority? Maybe it's because the saving is really a byproduct of his lordship. See, we like to think, God, I, I want you to save me, and I'm really into Christmas, Jesus, because I want to be saved, but then I just want to live how I want to live. That's why we pray hard in crisis and are complacent in the good times. Because it's like, I really need you now because I need saving, but, but once I'm out of the fire, ah, I just don't really have time. It's not really a priority. See, we want the saving Without the serving. Let God save me and I'll just serve you and live for you when I get around to it. See, salvation is about where we will spend eternity. But his lordship is about how you will fulfill your destiny. See, so salvation, absolutely, it's a free gift and it secures things on the other side. But his lordship, man, if you want to make a difference, we've got to understand him as Lord. That's why Romans 10 verse 9, and it was mentioned in the script today, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Notice you declare with your mouth that he's Lord first, and then you're saved second. He cannot operate as your Savior until he's been accepted as your Lord. I just, I just don't want to coast through the Christmas season and have people thinking that you can pick and choose what part of Jesus you bring into your life. You can't just pick and choose. You can't do that. You can't say, hey, I'm good because Jesus is my Savior and then not have him as your Lord. See, salvation is his function, but Lord is his position. And so Christmas begs the question, do you want Jesus to save you and not be your Lord? Or are you willing to give him control of your life? Jesus is not the Burger King. You can't have it your way. You got to make, and who, really, honestly, who has Burger King anyways? <laughs> Some of you. Problem is that Burger King, I mean, you take any fast food, it just doesn't ever come as advertised. You should walk in someday with a picture of a Big Mac and ask them to make that. They can't do it. <laughs> On oh, to some, Jesus doesn't come as advertised, but. You need to know that, that the whole package, the whole picture is that you need, you need him as Savior and Lord. Are you willing to let him take the lead in your life? Lordship is really about leadership. Lordship is that moment where you say, God, I'm okay with you being in charge. God, I'm going to let you come in and fix stuff. Everyone knows Jesus was raised a carpenter. What do carpenters do? They fix things. I just... I just want you to save me. No, he wants to save, and he wants to get in, and he wants to fix, fix, and he wants to redecorate and maybe remodel your heart and your attitude a little bit. Maybe you need to let him get in and start reorientating some behaviors, some thoughts, some habits, some passions, some, some priorities. And, and the truth of it is, and, and, and this is where it pertains to our joy, is that as long as you're in control, as long as you're the boss, joy is off the table. Because you'll always be striving 
and always be chasing and always be pursuing, running after false advertisements, running after fake news, thinking that somehow those things are going to provide the, the satisfaction that you need deep down inside, and it just isn't going to happen. See, because salvation brings forgiveness, but it's his lordship that will bring freedom. And we want, we want to be free. I want to be free of guilt and shame and condemnation. I want to be free of my habits. I want to be free of my addictive tendencies. I want to be free of insecurity. I want to be free of anxiety and depression. I want to be free of worry and stress. I want to be free of comparison. I want to be free of always feeling bogged down and exhausted. I want to be free. If you really want to be free, he's got to be Lord. Is he in control of your emotions? Have you given him control of your feelings? Have you given him control of your finances? Have you given him control of your sexuality? Have you given him control of your ambition? Like, is he Lord over your passions? Because, see, if you would let him take the lead, then he'll release you to make the unique difference on the planet that he created you to make. But you'll never know it, you'll never realize it, and you'll never get there unless he's the leader. Watch what happens to the disciples, or the, the, the shepherds. So suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace on the, on the, to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. Let's go and see. When you make Jesus your Lord and not before, but when you make him your Lord, when you receive him as Savior and Lord, you will see him. They didn't see him until he was the leader. They didn't see him until they followed what he said to do. They did not see him. If you really want to see Jesus, if you really want to know him personally, if you really want to know him intimately, if you really want to be face to face, like if you really want to see Jesus, you can't do it and live however you want to live. It just doesn't work. If he's the leader, then you've got to follow his leadership and follow him. And, and I, I hear all the time, man, I just, I've been coming to church, but I just don't see Jesus. I just am not seeing him. Well, it's because you're not following him. If you really want to see him, you got to let him be in control. Oh, but I'm like, I'm trying, and I come to church, and I do, I just, I just, there's so many things in my life that are out of control right now. My relationship's out of control. My career's out of control. My health is out of control. If there's an area of your life that's out of control, it's because he's not in control. It's a leadership issue. But when you receive him as Savior and Lord, man, you're going to see him. You're going to see his goodness and his love and his mercy and his care and his provision and his miracle working power. Now you're going to see him. It says in verse 17, when they'd seen him, they spread word concerning what had been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. Not only, like once he's Savior and Lord, you're going to see him like you've never seen him. Then what do they do? They share him. They've come. They've had an encounter. They've seen him. Something's happened. Something's shifted in their hearts. And they can't help but share him. You know how you can tell if Jesus is Lord? How often do you share him? Because if it's a struggle for you to share him, then you're probably not really seeing him. It's like a great product. When you try something that really works, you tell everybody about it. You try something, and it's awesome. Man, I, candy cane fudge crackle ice cream from President's Choice. You can get it at Superstore. I talk about it every Christmas. Why? Because it's amazing. It's like salvation in frozen non-dairy but still fake dairy form. No, because when you see something and you experience something and it's incredible, you can't help but tell people about it. The shepherds see him. They have a moment with him. These insignificant, overlooked, all but forgotten, pushed to the side people are drawn into the narrative of Scripture because God sees value in them. And then they see him, and they can't contain it. They have to say something. 
walk as when he's Savior. And Lord, you see him and you share him. I just have this feeling that in 2018, Experience Church, we're going to see him like we've never seen him. We're going to share him like we've never shared him. But if it's going to happen, we've got to let him lead us like he's never led us. If it's going to happen, we've got to decide to not let Christmas come and go and just acknowledge the Savior in the manger. We've got to come and kneel at the foot of the manger and realize that it's not just for our rescue, but he's here to be Lord of our lives in control. I'd like you to bow your heads. We're going to pray together. And you know, I want this just to be a, a private moment between you and the Lord. I'm so, I'm so passionate about this because the byproduct of seeing him and sharing him is that it says all who heard were amazed. Friends, our city is not going to be amazed by a church doing a production well every weekend. Our city is not going to be amazed by a sermon or a song or a small group. But if you see him and your life is changed and you start to share about what that looks like and what that experience has been like for you, then the city will see and all will be amazed at what they've heard. 2018 needs to be a year where our city is amazed at what they hear about Jesus. Because I'm tired of the false advertising. I'm tired of people thinking that Christianity is associated with racism and, and Christianity is associated with oppression and guilt and Christianity is about what you can't do and can't have. No, no, no. Let's change the script. Let's see him. And then let's share him. Because Jesus is about hope and love and peace and fulfillment and ultimately the joy that you can only find through him. So if you're here this morning, every head is bowed, as every eye is closed. I want to give you a moment, an opportunity. There are some people in your life, you've got moments you can identify. See, that like is chaos right now. And part of the reason you're experiencing chaos in an area of your life is because you've never made Jesus Lord. There are some in the room, you've never made the decision to have a relationship with Jesus. I'm going to count to three if that's you. You came this morning not just to watch the overload of cuteness that came forth from the stage, but because Jesus was coming to you to remind you that you're valuable and that he can lead you in the life he created you for. You don't have to do it on your own. When I hit three, you've never made that decision. Today's your day. I want you to raise your hand, and we're going to pray together. We're not going to center you out. This is a moment between just you and him. God's got a plan for your life, and that's why you're here. Here we go. One, two, on three, you lift up your hand. Go ahead. Three. Amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Go ahead. You can put your hands down. If you made that decision today in your heart, maybe you made it with a raised hand, I'm going to pray for you. And in, in just a moment, our prayer team is going to come to either sides of the stage. And I'd encourage you, maybe you're dealing with a little bit of holiday chaos of your own. Maybe consider yourself a believer, but you've got some stress. You just need to let Jesus take control of that area. I want you to come and see some of our prayer team. But right now, for everyone who raised a hand or made a decision in their heart, would you repeat this simple prayer after me? Come on, EC, let's say it together. Say, Jesus, I can't do it on my own. I'm giving you control. Take the lead in my life starting today. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give it up for everyone that made that decision this morning. Amazing. Hey guys, welcome to Next Steps. Man, 